Okay, hello folks. This what I'm about to make is a video because I want to explain the relationship that I had with Chris. And it goes back all the way from when he was about five years old. And I've had the fortunate time slot to be with him for a lot of summers. He would come and stay whatever ranch I happened to be on, he would be there. And um, it was, you know, everybody knew Chris and what a good person he was and everything else. But he did as much for me as I think I did for him. What I tried to do for him, the, the secret, if I had to guess, watching everything else, was that I figured out real early to treat him like an adult. Don't treat him like a child. Okay, adult meaning somebody that had enough sense to make decisions. So I remember him in three, three sections, small, medium, and large. And when he was small, I'll just tell you some of the things that happened during his lifetime with me, which got him from five years old probably up to college. But we were on a ranch up in Julian, California. We worked on two different ranches there, but this one, I told him, I, I mentioned that night, I said, I got to get up at dark 30 because I got a big day ahead of me. And Chris looked at me, he says, I want to go. I said, well, I'm telling you, it's going to be a long day, and I'm going to be up at the dark and gone. He said, I want to go. I said, we'll see. Okay, when I said the word, we'll see, that was the deciding factor for Chris. He didn't say a word, put on his pajamas, went to bed, everybody went to bed. I got up at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and laying in front of the door in the living room was Chris. Hat, scarf, boots, had his hat on, sound asleep, because he knew that when I stepped over him to open that door, it'd wake him up. And right then, I thought, you know what, this guy's not kidding. This is serious. So I woke him up and got him his Fruit Loops, and then we took off, and it was a long day. And the beauty of Chris was he could fall asleep in about 12 seconds in a pickup, but he never complained. So that's how we started our career, him and I. That was small. And then on a different ranch in Julian, we gathered cattle, and I had my friend Chucky Palvo, who's a really good hand. He's a Native American from the, I think, the La Jolla Revs. He was helping because he was really good help. Anyway, we gathered the cattle, and Chris was on behind Susie, and he was pretty small. And he was small enough where I could ride up and pick him up by the jacket and lift him off the horse. That's how little he was. So we got the cattle in the corral, and I picked him up and set him in the back of the pickup, and I said, these cattle are touchy, and we might tear the corral down, so I want you to stay in the back of this pickup. And I threw him a bag of Fritos. And he never said a word. He just looked at me, and I turned around, and we went to work about four hours later, we're sitting there in the corral, hot, dusty, I mean hot. And we hear this noise, and me and Susie and this Indian are sitting there, and he goes, can somebody help me? And I'm like, oh, my God. I forgot all about him in the back of the truck. And Chucky looked at me, and he said, you sorry son of a bitch. You left that kid in that truck all this time. <laughs> so I rode over, and here stands Chris in the back of the pickup. He didn't get out. He'd wet his pants, and he was holding this bag of Fritos because he could not open them. I mean, I can't even open them today. <laughs> and that poor kid fought them Fritos for I don't know how long. So that, there's a moral there somewhere. I have no idea what it was. But that's me looking at Chris feeling like a pretty sorry human being. And his mom would bring him up to the ranch because in California when we worked there and other places really... She'd bring him up, and then she'd say, well, I'll be back Sunday, because she was in the educational world. Which, incidentally, she wanted him to be ringing around me, I think, because he was what they called gifted back then, and uh, super smart, and they wanted to get him in all these accelerated programs, and she said, no, he's going to go to school like every other kid. And she sent him to me so I could he could be exposed to the life experience is a nice way to put it. In other words, he'd get filthy, learn to pee outside, and he was going to be tough. 
So when she'd come pick him up, he'd always know it was Sunday morning, and he'd go down where the gate was coming into the ranch, wherever it was. He'd make a fort, and he would hide. Okay, he loved having her drive in the ranch, drive past him, not see him, and then he'd walk back to the house. And every time he'd say, you didn't see me, did you? And she'd say, no, no, she probably did, but <laughs> she was cool. She said, no, I didn't see you, and so he was thrilled then. But that was, um, that was him. Now, medium, he was probably this high. And, uh, and um, you know, this is a kid, you know, you look at looking through the fog, he spent his small, small and medium, half of his medium time, looking through a fog because of his glasses were so thick, he couldn't see through them because they were always filthy. Okay. Anyway, he followed me around in Buffalo, Wyoming, Tell me about a story, because he was reading books then. And there was a rabbit, and he kept telling me about this rabbit and all these characters. And every once in a while I'd say, now, what about that one guy? And he'd say, Uncle Pat, and he'd start over. Well, come to find out it wasn't a rabbit at all. It was a hobbit, which I had no <laughs> idea what a hobbit was. So anyway, I got to learn about that that summer. Over and over again. And he never, he, you know, he never, didn't bother him to start over with that story. It just killed me. But we went up to the PK Ranch out of Sheridan, and we ran an association, which means a whole lot of ranchers turn their cattle up on the forest. And since I was a cow boss for the ranch, I was responsible for going up and looking things over because we had a camp man. Anyway, when Chris and I would go up there, we always slept outside because you don't go in a man's camp as far as I'm concerned. Camp men are kind of different, so you leave them alone. That's why they're camp men. They don't want to be bothered. So we'd always stay outside and sleep in our bedrolls and look up at the stars. Remember that. The stars is what we love to watch. Anyway, he was mounted by then. I had him. I always kept him on a good horse. And we went all day one time and checking the cattle and there was a lady that came along, and her daughter was about the same size as Chris, and she had to ride behind her mom. Well, Chris had his own horse then. And um, at the end of the day, we were sitting there looking back towards the cattle, and, and we were about a quarter mile from the camp. And the little girl said, Mom, I want to ride in front of you because I can't see. And she was just wore out, this little kid. And her mom said, Well, you can't because there's no room in front of me on the saddle. I said, well, hell, she can just get on behind Chris. And Chris said, she's not riding with me. I said, really? And he said, no, she's not riding with me. I said, all right, then you can walk. And he just got off that horse and started walking. He knew where camp was. She got on his horse, and we walked and passed him up. He never said a word. I looked back every once in a while and I'd see this straw hat bobbing up and down in the sagebrush because that's how short he was. And here's the hook. Here's the deal that happened. It was no different when he laid in front of the door. Whenever he'd get in trouble because he had a tendency to have a temper and I knew that. And my goal was to get him over that. Well, he pretty much got himself over it, but I did help him out with a few exercises. Anyway, whenever he got back to cow camp, like always, his whole life, he never said one single word about what happened. I never said one single word about what happened. Brand new day. Let's water the horses. We've got to get them kicked out. Da, 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 da. So that's kind of the way it went with Chris and I because I didn't need to rag on him. He already knew. And then that gave him a time to cool off that quarter mile hike. So when he was that age... One of the highlights was he would wear costumes. And I'm sure you can all relate to that now, Star Trek. But he would be a Ninja Turtle one day, and he might be Zorro, and then he might be something that I had no idea what it was. And I never told him, you have to wear cowboy boots, you got to wear a cowboy hat. I never told him that. I didn't care. So he had a ball dressing up, and the cowboys that worked around us, they would just... They just loved seeing him walk out in the morning with me or ride up to see what kind of a deal he had on. And uh, what was funny was that he had enough presence as a little medium-sized child that people didn't ask him a lot of questions. 
And I, that always kind of tickled me because he he had a presence about him where they, were, they didn't say nothing. Why are you dressed like a turtle? They didn't ask him. They just watched him. And we trailed cattle once a year off the PK. We'd go 50 miles east. It took three days. And by then I had him on a horse called Headlight. And it was a big bald-faced horse, which means his head was all white. That's why we called him Headlight. And it took it was a three day trail drive, and I put Chris once we got going through town, going through the town of Sheridan with 500 head of heifers it gets a little western. But once we got on the other side, we were just on county roads, and I'd put him out in the lead, meaning out way in front of the cattle. And his job was that when he came to a railroad crossing, which there was a lot of them because that's coal country, hundred car train loads, they don't stop for anything. And I said, if you see a train coming, you turn that horse around and raise your sword and we'll stop driving the cattle and they'll stop and eat grass along the road until you're ready to go again, until the train's gone. And so he did that. He'd be up there and every once in a while you could see him swinging the sword and he was talking a language. I have no idea what it was, but it doesn't matter. He'd turn that big horse around, sit there and sure as heck, we'd stop, the cattle would stop. He'd turn around, we'd go. Then at night he'd make a little fort in the brush and hide in the fort and put his shield outside. And then the cowboys would say, boy, I wonder where Chris is. And he'd be in there giggling because he thought he was, he loved to hide. I don't know what that was about. So anyway, that was uh, one of the cool parts. And he had this point in his life where I used to take him once a week to the Wyrno Bar if we could get, if we weren't too tired. And he liked to shoot pool geometry imagine that and so I take him to shoot pool and I told him I said if you if you lose your temper because you've lost or you can't make a shot then we're done that's all I said and Bill the cowboy that owned the bar it'd be me and Chris and Bill the only people in the bar and Chris and I'd be back there shooting pool and Bill knew that I was working on his temper and anyway, Chris ended up throwing his stick down on the table because he missed a shot or something. And I said, that's it. You're on your own. And I turned around and looked at Bill, and he nodded his head, and I just walked out of the bar. I, as I left, I said, Bill, you can do it him, whatever you want with him. I don't care. So I got my truck and drove off. This was probably 8 o'clock at night. And evidently, Bill said, well, go out and sit on the steps because there's, I'm, I'm closing the bar. There's nobody here. Just sit out on the steps, he might come back and get you. Well, what he did was he put Chris out on the steps and he shut the lights off. Then he sat behind the bar and watched him until I came back. He had my back built in. He was a good guy. Anyway, I let him stew about a half an hour. And I drove back with the pickup, whipped it around in front of the stairs. Same thing. He got in, never said a word. I never said a word. We went to the house. He never did it again on the pool table all the way up until he came to see us in Arizona at 20 some years old. All right. So that was kind of a one of those moments. And he was a natural athlete as everybody knows, but I think from a young age his, his real passion was martial arts. And um, I could tell that he really liked it. And when he was when he got large I hired him and told him, I said, I'm gonna, you know, you're going to draw wages this summer because I need somebody to irrigate and work around the ranch. And so he got put on the payroll. And if I remember right, it was 600 a month room and board. So <laughs> that was uh, his big paying deal. But one day he told me, we had a creek running through the ranch. He told me, he said, I can go up the creek because this was during the Rambo movies. He said, and I'll bet you I can get in that creek and come down all the way to the bridge, which is at the house, and you won't be able to see me. I said, you're on, because I was riding up and down that all day long, riding colts and checking cattle. So I gave him a head start, and about a half an hour later or something, I started off, and he sure as hell did it. He made it down that creek, and he loved getting his eyes just above the water line, you know, and he had the band around his head, and he got in with all his clothes on. He just went in like Rambo did. And by God, he made it to that bridge. And he's <laughs> come crawling out of that creek, soaking wet. But he did it. And, you know, that's the kind of stuff that 
I thought was pretty cool. In the irrigating deal with setting dams, which is a, if you don't know anything about irrigating, it's a 12 hour set usually. And at 6 in the morning, you set your water to start scattering across the ground. And then at 6 in the evening, you set your water again. That's the way it worked on the ranch I was at. Well, we also had a wheel line on 100 acres. And he moved the wheel line. Same thing. But he didn't move the wheel line like normal people do. It's an aluminum sprinkler system that's on wheels. And it's about probably 3.5 feet off the ground. So he'd start this little gas engine, which would engage these gears that would move this sprinkler system down the hill. Well, while it was moving, he would run at it going downhill and dive over it and do somersaults and then get up before the wheel line hit him. <laughs> and I see this from a distance and I didn't know if he'd gone nuts or what, but then it dawned on me, that's Chris. So he loved working on his martial arts and he would face it and then it would come roll up to him. He'd dive over the other way. That's how he entertained himself, because there wasn't no crew, there wasn't a whole lot of people there. And uh, that was always kind of another thing he liked to do. And uh, he learned to drive as a kid, 14 probably, I don't know. Had him drive the truck and drive a tractor, drag the fields. And um, he cut wood with bow socks. I wouldn't let him run a chainsaw because I knew his mother would kill me. So I had a tree got hit by lightning, knocked down, of course, all the limbs and stuff were on it, and I gave him a bow saw. I said, I want you to cut everything you can until you get to the main part of the tree that's too big a diameter to cut. You decide. So what you got to know is a side note. He's got this bow saw, and then I go buy C-cell batteries for his cassette machine that he carried with him then. And it was what I called rat choking music. It was the most terrible music I've ever heard in my life. But I never said a word. That's the deal we had. So he would go out there and he'd turn that thing on full blast. And then he'd get his bow saw and he'd hold it above his head like a samurai sword. Then he'd step up and start running that saw, cutting those limbs. And he cut that entire tree up where it was just the, the main part of the tree was laying there. And I don't know how many days it took him, but he did it. He never complained. As long as he had that damn music, he was just fine. So that was, you know, that's the way he worked. And part of that reason was because I'd say, here's the saw, there's the tree. Do you have any questions? No. Goodbye. I never sat on the stump and watched him. I never told him how to do anything. I, you know, I would show him if he asked me a question, but I left him alone. He was on his own. So we had a team of horses. I always had a team back up, up there. Had a nice team of Belgians. We called them piss and moan mares. And um, he would help me catch horses in the morning because I had about 20 saddle horses I was riding for my horse sale. And uh, when we needed the team, he knew how to harness the team. And then he could load hay in the barn. He was horseback, helped me work cattle. Him and I could take I think it was 400 steers and get them to come down the, through the chute and we'd worm them. And he would hide behind a post and as they went by, he'd just kind of stick the wormer out and squirt them on the back. And um, in other words, we turned it into a smooth, fun day. And uh, that reminds me, that he worked sheep also because Alex Harry, the Basco down in Buffalo, who was nicknamed Bluto by me, you can imagine what he looked like, double tough. Anyway, we went down there and helped him work sheep, and it was really funny because Chris was a straight-up teenager, and he loved jumping things and hand sprints and all, whatever the hell else you do. I'll never forget, he jumped over the fence and hooked his toe and did a flop right in front of Alex's mother. And she had a pith helmet on with a solar fan and these big, long cigarettes. And he's laying at her feet, and she's holding this long cigarette looking down at him. He gets up, he's kind of embarrassed, you know, and I'm dying laughing. I almost fell off my horse. But we worked probably a band of sheep, which was, I think, 1,200 is what Alex had. And um, he was right there, you know, wherever he needed to be. And um, uh, the horse races, we had a couple of them. So I used to, I used to promote some things because of just because of fun things to do. And we had a bar-to-bar -bar 
cross-country horse race. And it was from Arvada to Larderville. And I set up the course cross-country, and I told all the locals that wanted in, there ended up to be five three-man teams. I said, you go out there this summer, I've got, I've got it marked, you can practice riding it, do whatever you want, I don't care, because then when we have the race, everybody will know where they're going. So anyway, Chris was in that race. I put him on a big horse called Seymour because he always ran with his tail up and you could see more than you really wanted to. But anyway, the point is, he was game enough to do what, you know, and I said, you know, I want to put you in this horse race. He goes, good on you. No worries. You know, whatever he, was, anything I said was fine. So he rode in that race and it was a three mile each team to the next team. All right. When they left the bar at Arveda, the first group all knew Chris because we, you know, they were all ranchers, and they knew Chris was not a real experienced rider. So they said, "Chris, you get in the middle," and they pretty much surrounded him, and in a group, they took him across country. Now this is not walking; this is a race, and they told him the last 200 yards, when we get on the flat, we'll join our next group. You're on your own because we're we're in a horse race then. And so they kept him surrounded, which I never said they had to do or anything. It's just good kind of people I hung with. So he did his leg, and he made it through, never fell off or anything. And it was pretty darn impressive to me. But anyway, the bar, the bar deal, everybody jumped their pickups from the first bar and ran around the highway to the other bar. And by the time they got there, the race was damn near over. The third group was coming in. And, of course, Chris and everybody else, they just kind of walked their horses in because they'd already run their part of it. But the point is, it was a smashing success. Okay. I also put him in a horse race around a 70-acre polo field. And I'm, I can't remember the occasion, but it doesn't matter. So there was three or four horses entered in the race, and I said, do you want to race? He goes, sure. So once again, there's a famous picture of me pointing him out to the track. And uh, he did it. And I remember him coming in, and he was absolutely exhausted, but his adrenaline was pumped so high, he could have picked that horse up and hugged it if he wanted to. So that was a good, you know, the near-death experience thing, I didn't tell his mom all this stuff, but the near-death experience thing kind of helped him, you know, grow up, I think. It was a good deal, because when he accomplished something like that, just like going down to Cricket's Rambo, it was a big deal to him. And then we, I had a horse sale every year, and uh, I'd sell 20 horses, and he was in the background. He liked staying in the back. He was watching the crowd. He had the Jack Benny look, he called it. And he'd watch, make sure people didn't, you know, do something stupid with the horses that were for sale. And he came and got me one time because there was a drunk guy on the horse that he'd bought, and he went in the corral and got on it. And Chris let me know, and I went back there and straightened him up. And we just worked as a team, a silent team. Our time was in the evening down in Buffalo. One time we laid on the hood of the truck and put our back on the windshield and looked straight up at the stars. And he explained to me the constellations and this is that and that's that. And once again, we got to sit and look at the stars just like when we slept in a bedroll. It was pretty, pretty cool that we could just lay out un, underneath the sky and look up. And I think that kind of stuck with him. And so when he was large, once again, he learned to play guitar. He got help from a couple Australians we had at the ranch. And Wayne helped him start learning how to play guitar. What he never got was learning how to sing. He's the most pitiful singer I ever heard in my life. Sounded like a Mongolian throat singer crossed with a dying calf. And But I didn't care. Same old thing. I didn't have to listen to it. So on his last year at the ranch... I said, you can bring some of your college buddies if you want. I'll give you the upper floor of the barn because it, the upper floor was empty. And I said, we'll put a fridge up there and a bunch of cots. You guys can have at it because I can't hear your music from the house. And he'd just laugh and he'd say, sure. So he brought some young people from Japan that were students at Salem where he went to school. And then he had Paco and another young lady that I got to see at the memorial. And they took over the barn, and they had a ball around there. And I remember the one Japanese kid was an absolute phenomenal baseball fanatic. He loved baseball. He always had a glove and a ball with him. And they were good kids. So I put him in the 
parade, there's a picture of Chris with the wagon with the kids in it and me driving. It was a parade in Buffalo, Wyoming. And I told the Japanese kids, I got a bunch of big, giant cowboy hats. And I put them on them. And I said, now you guys are going to see what it looks like to have your picture taken because you guys are always taking pictures. So they sat in that wagon. They looked like bobblehead dolls because their hair was cut like this. And they are going down the road like that. Chris was on Seymour, and he jumped from the horse onto the wagon, back onto the horse, and we just had a ball. And then the, the, the highlight of the summer was one evening, I said, I'm going to take you guys on a hayride it's, and tonight. And um, so we got the team and the wagon and the hay on it and put them all on the hay, and then I went out and we rode out in the prairie there with the team and I remember them laying on the hay and they were all looking straight up and it was like I was listening to a whole different culture talking. They were talking about the stars and the black hole and this and that and I was just amazed at the intelligence of these young people and how much they appreciated the sky and how how everything had evolved you know it was just very impressive to be around young people that were so darn cool and so I think the moral of the story for me is that Chris and I had an admiration for each other that was just couldn't be touched by anybody we had our own world and I was very proud of him and we never elaborated on a whole lot of things we just did things and I think to look back, I told you already that he made me survive just by having his company. But I think what I left him with, the main thing was the stars because he loved them. And a work ethic because I left him alone. And if I gave him a project, he never complained. And if I explained it to him and I said, do you have any questions? And he said, no, I just left, okay? Well, he maybe didn't understand everything he needed to do, like fix and fence, but the thing of it was, he figured it out. And I knew he would. And I think that's a big thing that's it's hard to find now, is to be able to give somebody a job and let them figure it out. And that's what he loved doing. That was part of his life, was figuring out a puzzle. So anyway... Of course, everybody says there'll never be another one. Well, that's not true. He's got two sons, and there will be another Chris. And he's got a lovely wife, and they're going to be just fine. And I just wanted folks to understand what it was, the connection that I got to have with that young, small, medium, and large man. So, thank you.
bluebirds fly And the dream that you did to Oh why, oh why can't I I, I well I see trees of green and red roses too I watch them bloom for me and you and I think to myself